morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. You know, since March of 2020, we have now produced over 150 live streams for you. And I want to remind you that all of them are available for viewing on our website. At the end of today's program, I will provide you with a brief update on our upcoming programs. Remember to visit our website to register for upcoming programs, view past programs, renew your membership, or make a donation. And for those of you who aren't yet members, an individual membership is only $100 per year, only about $8 a month, and includes exclusive benefits, which you can also check out on our website. So thank you. For those of you who would like to ask our speaker and moderator questions today, there is a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 30 or 35 minutes. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, National Security and the Right to Privacy in the Digital Age, with Glenn Gerstel, former general counsel at the National Security Agency. And our moderator today is Sina Bagley, who is the senior national security policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Sina, we're so appreciative of your moderating today's program. Let me bring you on and have you introduce today's speaker. Okay, great. Thank you, Kim, very much. And Glenn, I think you're going to join. There we go. Perfect. Uh, well, let me join the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall uh, in welcoming Glenn to this session. We're all very excited to, to chat with him and, and hear his insights. Uh, so Glenn, welcome and thank you for joining us. Let's, uh, let's get right into it, as I have a feeling this is going to be really interesting and robust discussion on uh, the topics of cybersecurity and the digital revolution. And there's, you know, as always, lots going on in the news to uh, keep it very, very current. So in that vein, You've written a lot about the intersection of technology and of national security. And you've talked about the speed with which the digital revolution has swept through all of our lives and how some of the bad uses of that technology uh, has significant implications for national security, for privacy, for our way of life. So what would you say are the implications of all of that for our national well-being and for national security more broadly? Thanks so much, Sina, uh, to you for moderating this, and thanks uh, to Kim and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council for uh, having this program and inviting me to join. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion, and, and uh, Sina, you've asked uh, a fabulous opening question. We could probably spend just an hour on that alone. Or do we have any other questions after that? Because this is going <laughs> to take up all the time. But, but um, it is a terrific opening question, and maybe what I can do uh, to respond and sort of set the table for our, our discussion is <clears throat> uh, address the, the effects of the, of, of you said, as you said, the, the digital revolution, the so-called fourth industrial revolution. There are many effects. Uh, we all appreciate some of them. We don't appreciate uh, others of them. But let me, there are three that stand out to me uh, three effects or implications that I think warrant discussion. Let me just put them on the table and then come back and explain why I think we don't pay much, as much attention to those three implications as we should, and then examine them a little more deeply. So the first uh, one is that uh, as a result of technology, the digital revolution, um, for the first time in our nation's history, certainly since we became a global power, and perhaps going back two centuries to say the last time the British invaded us in, in 1815, our domestic well-being, our national security, is now affected um, by foreign entities located overseas that can have an effect on our domestic soil. We never used to be worried about threats on our manifesting themselves on our domestic soil, with the exception of 9-11, of course. But, but previously, we've always dealt with foreign threats where they resided, overseas. And now we're seeing that those foreign threats can have an effect here on domestic soil. And we're not just fighting wars abroad, but, but 
but dealing with problems here in, in the United States. So that's point one. Um, point two is, again, for the first time in our nation's history, our domestic well-being, our national security, in other words, is really be shifting and becoming far more a factor of the private sector as opposed to the federal government. Under our constitution, it's the federal government that provides for our, quote, common defense. And yet uh, we're seeing increasingly, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, um, how some vulnerabilities in the private sector are far more likely to affect our day-to-day -day well-being, our commercial lives, uh, the economy, our public health, than uh, the threat of, say, nuclear missiles from another country. Not that we shouldn't take that seriously, of, 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 of equally seriously, of course. And the third factor is that one of the most pernicious aspects of the digital revolution, uh, which is cyber-propelled disinformation, is actually having and has the potential to have a grave, grave threat, present a grave threat to our to our society far more uh, than many of these other factors we've been talking about. So I'd like to spend some time on each of those three, but, but before doing that, maybe we can just look for a second at, at why we are so slow to embrace all this. Uh, we sort of have a sort of intellectual sense about it, but we're not really embracing it. The same way, for example, after 9-11, our country, quote, got it. We understood the threat that uh, foreign extremist terrorism presented. Our country mobilized in a wide range of areas, adapting government, private sector, our everyday lives changed. And we fully understood the threat, embraced it, addressed it, and, and, and are managing it, I might add, so far quite successfully. That hasn't been the case with the pernicious aspects of the digital revolution. I think the first reason for that is it's all so new. Um, we tend to forget because it's so pervasive and how it intrudes into every aspect of our lives that it wasn't always there. Uh, the Facebook is what, uh, founded in 2004, uh, less than a generation ago as principally a app for college students. And it really didn't become a thing in our lives until say 2010 or so, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Uh, YouTube is 2005, founded in 2005. Again, didn't become significant until just a handful of years ago. The iPhone was only invented 13 years ago. So we forget that it's we're really dealing with fundamental changes occurring in less than a generation. And if you compare that to other technologies, electricity, radio and TV, aviation, railroads, pick whatever one you want, um, it took decades between the time of the initial invention and the time the technology manifested itself in a pervasive and ubiquitous way in our everyday lives. And during those decades, we had time to develop rules of the road, norms, how much is public regulated, how much is privately regulated, how much is governed by the free market, what safety regulations we should have. True, it often took a disaster to do that. And you could point to, say, a terrible aircraft, uh, uh, crash in 1934, the killing of Newt Rockne, a famous football coach that led to the formation of what became the Civil Aeronautics Board and the National Safety Transportation Board. Um, you could point to railroad disasters, et cetera. But um, at some point, we had some decades to deal with that. And here, here, as I said, it's just a matter of years. So no surprise that we've been slow to react. And we do have a reactive society. Our approach to regulation is is retroactive. We're not very much like the Europeans who are more proactive in anticipating regulation. So that's a factor. Another factor is we sort of love the technology. It's a wonderful plaything, and we don't want to tinker with it or intrude with it too much. We're, we, we marvel at it, and who wants to regulate it and possibly curtail it or stop innovation? So that's another, another factor. Um, so you, you put all these um, factors together, and, and also the fact that the, maybe I should add that the, that the just the, the sheer enormity of the change, the, the, the shift from the federal government to the private sector is hard for us to grasp. So you put all these factors together, no surprise, we're, we're, we're slow uh, at, 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 at addressing the, the negative aspects of the technology. So just very quickly running through them, we can spend more time on them. The first point, as I said, is that our well-being for the first time is really affected by uh, what happens overseas, uh, our domestic well-being. Um, and and uh, uh, that that just simply did not used to be the case. We used to deal, deal, deal with foreign threats where they resided. If some someone attacked, a, someone presented a 
threat to our interests, uh, whether it was in East Asia or Europe, we, we dealt with it there, not here. So that's clearly not the case with, with cyber, which has a pernicious effect, whether it's cybersecurity hacks and ransomware, or whether it's threats to um, uh, our public health because of a virus that starts halfway around the world and quickly becomes a problem here. Uh, we need to address problems on our domestic soil caused by something overseas and, and transmitted by technology or, or enabled by technology. Um, secondly, and it goes hand in hand with this, as I said, um, the private sector is now far more responsible for our well-being. Why? Because the private sector has vast amounts of data about all of us. We were fully aware of that. A leak or corruption of that data can have a big effect on us. The private sector uh, controls uh, through through digital means uh, our every aspect of our lives, from the electric grid to we just saw uh, e gasoline deliveries on the East Coast, um, to a, to a wide range of other of, of other. Uh, factors that permeate our entire society. And it's not just a question of the federal government dealing with it. Even at its heyday, General Motors uh, didn't affect, a disruption at General Motors wouldn't have affected our daily lives very much, it might have affected production of cars. But now, a serious disruption or problem at Google, at Visa, MasterCard, um, Facebook, Twitter, erroneous information on any of those, or a complete shutdown of those, those uh, programs and pl platforms, could have a disastrous effect, even if it was only for a matter of hours. So um, that is the second effect, which is the private sector is way more responsible and yet relatively unregulated in this area, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, just very quickly, and we can spend more time on this too, uh, we all sense that disinformation has a very pernicious effect on our society with, with many, many people in our country not, not uh, being certain of the legitimacy of the current president due to the, the disinformation about the recent election, with with some very sizable percentage of our population, perhaps a third, having questions about the efficacy of wearing face masks and taking vaccines to prevent COVID-19, that has effect on public health. And if questioning the legitimacy and our general public health aren't national security matters, then I don't know what one is. So those are the three factors that I think we should we should be focusing on and figuring out how to address. I know there was a lot, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Glenn. Yes. Well, there's a lot to a lot to unpack there. Uh, so let me let me start with uh, maybe current events. You had just alluded to uh, the uh, most recent, I guess, uh, and noticeable cyber attack that has affected some people's sort of physical uh, daily lives as well. Um, so cyber attacks, they're constantly in the news. Um, and in fact, as you alluded to, the Colonial Pipeline just this past week and into this week, uh, one of the largest U.S. fuel pipelines was forced to shut down its operations for a period of time as a result of this ransomware attack uh, targeting the nation's energy infrastructure. So that's a big deal, you know, the thinking about our, our critical infrastructure. So um, is the prospect of these types of cyber attacks, is it getting worse? And if so, why? What can we do about it in this digital age? Well, you're probably not going to like my answer. I don't think anyone is going to like it, and I certainly don't like it. But the short answer is this is going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. Um, and what do I mean by worse? Well, um, we have not, uh, when, we, when, when the internet was set up, of course, it wasn't set up to be a, uh, something that provided authentication for everybody. It was a, it was a, a rather open uh, network. And the consequence of that is that it produces many, many benefits, allowing anonymity, allowing uh, ease of use. Um, but it also has a negative aspect to it, which, of course, we appreciate, which is that someone can operate nefariously on it with relative impunity. And we so we certainly see that with nation states attacking us in the cyber domain. We see it with cyber criminals, whether they're foreign or domestic. And the colonial pipeline incident um, is sort of a, the most recent manifestation. It's fairly sophisticated. We should talk about who did it and why it's sophisticated. And it also was surrounded a little bit with disinformation because that sort of latched onto it with causing people to uh, have a run on gas stations, even though that wasn't really warranted because there in fact was enough gas. Um, I might add, just as an aside, we're pretty lucky that, that this was not a cyber attack that caused a natural gas pipeline to shut down. Natural gas produces about half the electricity in the United States. And it's delivered in a just-in-time basis, meaning that as the gas moves into the pipeline, it's used directly by a power plant. Unlike colonial pipelines, um, gasoline and kerosene uh, uh, deliveries, 
which go into storage tanks. And so there's a couple days buffer uh, mm -hmm. before the pipes run dry, so to speak. But you can imagine what would happen if the electricity in, in, during winter turned off for about half of a third of the country, quite, quite significant. Who did this? Um, right now, it looks like a company, uh, a group of, of, of criminals called the Dark Side did this. They're a rather sophisticated group, probably operating out of Russia, probably with the tacit approval of the Kremlin. It's sort of hard to envision that a group could be this significant in Russia, which is so closely monitored and ruled, and take a chance of causing international disruptions without at least uh, a, the Kremlin turning a blind eye, if not actually encouraging them. There's no sign yet that this was actually uh, an act of the Russian state government, which sort of complicates exactly how we might respond to it. Um, but this is a very sophisticated group. They do research on their intended victims. They know who to attack. They know how much money they might be able to pay. Uh, they know their names, their addresses. It's done through a typical phishing expedition to get inside a company's uh, emails. Lots of companies do not have the full adequate cybersecurity and prevention of phishing campaigns. And even once they start, to be able to bottle them up and stop them from getting worse. And so ransomware is implanted on this company. And it, although it only affected the, the corporate network, their email and back office network, it so happens that the billing part of their business is also on this network. So they sort of had no choice but to shut down the separate uh, network that also controls their operations. And this is true for many companies. And there are many companies that are in the same boat, which is they have not some, something less than robust cybersecurity practices. They're up against a really determined, sophisticated adversary. And the rule there is they're probably almost always going to get in. So it's not a question of keeping them out 100%. It's a question of once they get in, although you'll try the best to, to prevent them from getting in, once they get in, what steps do you have to prevent the damage from getting worse and spreading? That's the issue. Didn't look like that was the case in Colonial Pipeline's case. So with very sophisticated adversaries and a patchwork of quality uh, of, of cyber uh, security provisions and resilience in the private area of private sector infrastructure, as well as the federal government, um, I'm afraid we're doomed to a chronic disease that we need to manage rather than cure. And it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. We know how to make it better. There, there's nothing in the technology that we can't solve here, um, but it will take a lot of resources and a lot of effort. So in that vein, and you touched on this a little bit, uh, both in your introductory comments and what you just spoke about, there are two main actors in this, the federal government and the private sector, right? So the federal government, um, some say partly in response to, to what happened last week, um, issued today uh, an executive order, right, on cybersecurity. And so that applies in the federal space. That's where the government can sort of compel action. Um, but then to be effective, you've got to have the private sector that does its part. Um, otherwise, you're going to have, you know, these issues um, persist. They're going to persist, but how uh, well can we be prepared from a cybersecurity defensive standpoint and then recovery standpoint as well? So what is that role and responsibility for the private sector when it comes to cybersecurity? You've, you've hit upon a real uh, vulnerability or gap, so to speak, that cyber exploits. So um, something closer to home to you back in 2013, 2014, something like that, Sony Pictures produced a, uh, some would say, not, not so terrific movie about a North Korean dictator, a, a spoof. North Korea didn't like it. And as you know, uh, launched a cyber attack against uh, Sony Pictures there in Culver City, knocking off their computers, uh, their whole network, uh, exposing lots of documents and emails, et cetera. Um, and if instead the North Korean military at that time had launched one of their missiles at Sony Pictures Corporation, well, we know what the responsibility would be. It would involve a B-52 from the US Air Force, right? Um, but instead, what did we do? Well, after a month or two of figuring out that it really was them and figuring out the attribution, we imposed some sanctions on North Korea. Um, and North Korea and Russia and China and Iran, our four adversaries of the cyber world, all know about this gap in, in authority, which is that the private sector is largely left to fend for itself in the case of foreign cyber maliciousness, not in the case of foreign attacks in, a, in, a, in, other, in other spheres, uh, missiles, bombs, God forbid, um, but in cyber, yes. So uh, turning to the executive order, which was a very welcome step, and I certainly applaud it by uh, President Biden and his cyber team, um, 
uh, that goes a long way to, to raising the bar for the federal government. It's an executive order. It can only affect the executive branch. We still need Congress to pass some laws to Im impose uh, requirements for mandatory cyber breach notification, greater collaboration between the federal government and the cyber and the private sector on, on cyber matters. So there's a lot that Congress still needs to do. But this is a good first step for the federal government. Because it will apply to the federal government and defense contractors and people who contract with the government, it will have the effect of raising the level for all the private sector because what the federal government, the standards set by the federal government typically uh, permeate through the private sector. So it's a good step, but we need more. Um, and then uh, in terms of the private sector itself, uh, it's, it's extremely uneven. Very, very large companies with resources and a serious IT department, they're largely able to fend for themselves. They have pretty robust cybersecurity defenses. They're moving to so-called zero trust architecture, which is a different way of thinking about cybersecurity that sit, basically says, instead of building a wall or moat around our, our uh, enterprise, we're going to still have a moat, but not rely exclusively on it. And every time someone, so to speak, crosses the moat and comes into a room, we're gonna check them. It's an individual transaction-based approach to cybersecurity, so-called zero trust architecture. So as the, as the big companies move to that, that's great. They're more resilient. They can have backups. They can deal with ransomware. But a small hospital in a local county, um, a small business uh, that isn't, isn't a big defense contractor, they're just not in a position to address this. It requires a hiring a sophisticated cybersecurity firm, their own cybersecurity experts, and it's just unrealistic to think without a really concerted national effort of the kind I talked about at the beginning of my comment when I referred to 9-11, unless we have a really concerted national effort involving lots of resources, public and private, we're not going to change that very much. We can, and we will, it's gonna take time. Okay, well, let's move to another topic you raised in your kind of introductory comments, and that's this topic of disinformation, right? The rise of unreliable, sometimes intentionally deceptive information sources online. Uh, one way uh, I've heard it described uh, um, uh, with my own organization is virtual societal warfare or the concern about this, right? Bad actors, sometimes nation state actors with a lot of resources, um, provide. Uh, doing disinformation kind of operations activities online to intentionally undermine kind of the um, societal foundations, the economic, the social foundations of a nation sometimes to, you know, get uh, their uh, political motivations uh, met, uh, take presidential elections, for example, um, but lots of reasons and uses for disinformation. So why is it so bad and what can be done about disinformation um, to, to, to combat this? Well, there's no question it's a serious problem. You, you put your finger on it, absolutely. Um, and we all recognize uh, why that's the case. Um, uh, the internet, uh, in effect, gives everybody uh, on the internet the same size megaphone. Whether you're the New York Times or Washington Post, you have the same ability to reach everyone in the world as an individual blogger, whether you're someone on the right or left, doesn't make a difference. Uh, the old days of a curated news experience, when I was a little kid, to date myself, the way my family uh, got news was we listened to one of the ABC, NBC, or CBS nightly news, and that was the source of the news, or maybe two or three trusted newspapers. That's clearly not the case now, with a multiplicity of news outlets, uh, some objective, some biased, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and there are lots of benefits to a multiplicity and a diversity of voices. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there aren't many, many rich benefits we derive from the internet and, and its diversity of sources. So, so I wanna be very clear about that. Um, but it is possible um, for the, the evil and nefarious to crowd out the good or at least push it, push it significantly aside. I think that's probably a sort of a, I'm not much of a psychologist or a sci, uh, sociologist, but having read some of their reports, it's clear that, that just human nature being what it is, we're drawn to the more lurid, the more conspiratorial when we can't explain something or it's not easily understood. It's easy to believe in a conspiracy theory. Um, we're, we're going to tend to click on the bad news and read about the bad news and how many people were killed in a tornado or, or whatever uh, before we read a, a good news story. Not that we don't need good news stories, especially this past year, um, but maybe that's just human nature. And um, and unfortunately, with so few checks and balances on the internet, again, for, for good reasons, uh, 
some of the bad starts crowding out the good. And, and the algorithms of social media promote that. They amplify. The more clicks you have, the more it gets fed into your news cycle and, and gets amplified uh, almost without regard for truth. Now, to be fair, we've seen in the last year or two, belatedly, social media like Facebook, Twitter, others cut back on disinformation, deliberately wrong information, intentionally misleading information around election security and the pandemic and public health. But we still see very significant amounts of it. Uh, just recently, there was a really terrific report by Oxford and the Associated Press on one concerted campaign by China. And China and Russia in particular have a concerted integrated approach to disinformation very unlike the United States uh, and which is and we feel very uncomfortable with that we don't we don't have our government engage in propaganda hand in hand with the private sector that is exactly what China does so when their minister their minister minister of foreign affairs uh, issues uh, some pronouncement it's picked up by literally hundreds of 130 or so uh, Chinese diplomats around the globe all of whom have Twitter accounts it's then reverberated and amplified by fake Twitter accounts that they that they control, which then retweet it and forward it. That in turn causes algorithms to recognize it as popular if it gets gets spread around to to others, and it and a false narrative or misleading narrative can easily take place. And we've seen this time and again with Russia, uh, with China, a little bit with Iran and others. Um, and and just one quick example in in. Oregon at the wildfires, you may remember what a few months ago, um, there was a, someone put up a posting that Antifa was responsible for arson creating these wildfires. Uh, that quickly got picked up by Russian, uh, probably by Russian intelligence agencies, deliberately spread among their fake accounts and their controlled news sites and corroborated in a false way to make it look real. And the next thing we know, is that citizens in Oregon got so upset at Antifa that they started creating roadblocks, preventing prevent in an effort to catch the, the false Antifa protesters, uh, preventing people from escaping the wildfires. It got so bad that 9-11 call centers in Douglas County were overwhelmed with calls about this false, uh, th these falsehoods. And, the, and the, the local sheriff and the FBI had to issue a statement saying, please stop believing this nonsense. It's not true. So here's a Perfectly good example of how a domestically created created uh, falsehood is amplified by Russia in a concerted way, soon took over Facebook postings to an extraordinary degree, and produced a real-world negative effect for our country. So this is a serious problem. Um, how, how to fix it? Very briefly, um, you know, a wide range of things. It's because it's created by so many sources, both domestic and foreign. Uh, and also, to use my analogy for a minute ago, it's a, it's another chronic disease we're going to have to live with. We're not going to cure it. There's no magic bullet, no single drug we can take to get rid of it. Um, it's it's the it's the flip side of the anonymity of the internet and the power of the internet. All good things. Um, we're going to have to manage it. It's going to be a chronic disease we'll have to manage through civic education, probably through reform of Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, which provides a liability shield in some way. Um, through a whole series of other steps, including technology itself, to regulate algorithms uh, that, that, that promote false, false, uh, falsehoods. So lots of steps we can take, but again, another chronic disease that I'm afraid we're going to have to live with and 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 embrace and recognize it for what it is. Yeah. Well, and of course, there's a challenge there too with regard to uh, you know civil liberties and freedom of speech, right? And just the the whole challenge of disinformation, especially when it's a bad nation state actor behind it uh people then sharing that information because you know it's their right to share and express their views online um and and so those protections that kind of get involved and so moving on to a separate but related topic when you talk about um civil liberties you talk about those protections there's a big challenge in the digital revolution when it comes to this idea of privacy protections versus national security. And we, we all want the convenience of being able to quickly, you know, get into our accounts or get exactly what we want or ooh, even this recommendation to buy X, Y, and Z product. Um, but then there's this danger that uh, we're, we're um, releasing more and more about ourselves into the ether. So one topic I want to get to is goes back to your prior hat um, as the National Security Agency's general counsel beginning in 2015. 
you served in that role, so you have a really interesting perspective. I'd like to get you um, during both the Obama administration, transitioning into the Trump administration, and then in the Trump administration. Uh, in fact, I think you assumed that role just as I was leaving the White House, the National Security Council, uh, and my role there was dealing with the Edward Snowden NSA unauthorized disclosures, and so I'm sure we all have scars from, from that whole um, process. But this issue of privacy protection versus foreign intelligence collection really came to the fore in the wake of the disclosures. And then we hear it still in the media today. Um, you heard it you know, in the last administration when it came to intelligence collection and what's sure. the purpose how are we minimizing, you know, collection on, on U.S. persons, right? So can you speak a bit about the role of law and authorities when it comes to NSA intelligence collections um, and how U.S. person privacy protections are accounted for uh, in the wake of the Snowden disclosures in particular? Sure. A uh, couple of uh, good points uh, in, in a lot of good points in your, in your questions. You know, let me, let me, before I get to the NSA piece, let me uh, start with what you opened up with, which is sort of this question of privacy generally uh, on the internet and what it means. And, and um, you know, we we in America have a very different notion of privacy than in Europe. In Europe, it's sort of rooted in a sense of the right to be left alone and has some concept of the, the, the dignity of the individual, um, which uh, is why you can't publish certain photographs without your your approval, et cetera, and 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 things that uh, uh, a range of, uh, of restrictions that we would not allow here in the United States. In the United States, our sense of privacy, which is a, I'll say, well, I won't say relatively recent, but it's it's not something that's always been thought of in our in our society. Um, it sort of goes back to the perhaps in some ways the original terrific groundbreaking article by Justice Brandeis back in the late 20s uh, about the right to privacy, which was triggered actually by the advent of flash photography and the ability to wire pictures around the country very quickly of celebrities and others, and it was thought to be invasive of privacy. But before that, there's nothing about privacy. There's certainly privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution. We know that. The Fourth Amendment, which is really the thing that's closest to this, is all about uh, resisting government's uh, intrusion into the lives of, of individuals. And that grows out, for just a second to dwell on history, uh, grows from the colonialist experience with the, with the, 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 the British crown, which is the, the troops would knock down doors without warning or based on some general warrant that didn't specify anything in particular, looking for contraband, looking for seditious activities. And this really caused tremendous irritation among the colonists, leading to the adoption of of the Fourth Amendment and before that, similar provisions in state state constitutions. So for the first couple hundred years of jurisprudence of the Fourth Amendment, you see the Supreme Court talking about federal agents breaking down doors. And it isn't until 1967, as late as 1967, that the amendment is first applied to a telephone wiretap in which the court says, you've got a reasonable expectation of privacy and we're going to read that into the Fourth Amendment. Um, there's nothing in the Fourth Amendment about this. It doesn't say anything about electronic privacy. I can't think of another area of the Constitution where the current jurisprudence, the current rules and law, is as far removed from the original text and the original thoughts as this as this one is, due to technology. No one no one foresaw this in 1792, of course. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm just simply saying there's nothing in the Fourth Amendment that we could look at that's going to tell us. Um, how many days it's okay to monitor a cell phone location. We need the Supreme Court to do that in their 2018 Carpenter decision, which said the answer is seven days. Over seven days, you need a warrant. Under seven days, who knows? We'll have to wait the next case. So the result is we have a very unpredictable case law in this area, a very unclear sense of what privacy means anymore when the private sector knows, as you correctly pointed out, more about you. Google, Google and Facebook, and Instagram know what I had for breakfast, they know where I shop, they know my credit card numbers, they know almost everything about me, my family, et cetera, probably more than the federal government does. Uh, and uh, and I, I have a security clearance, so that's that's quite a fascinating statement. And, and yet we feel very uncomfortable regulating the private sector in this area. The Fourth Amendment has nothing to do with the private sector. So we are still, to going back to my earlier point, decades away, well, maybe maybe not decades, but certainly a decade or so, away from really coming up with a coherent, cogent sense of what we want privacy to mean in the digital age. Right now, 
I don't think we have a real sense of what we want in that area. So turning to uh, the NSA and surveillance, obviously the Fourth Amendment there does play a tremendous role because it does regulate the, the government and, and quite properly. I'm not in any, or don't misread any of my comments, I'm not suggesting any diminution of Fourth Amendment protections. But when I got into the office at the, at the NSA, having been a private sector lawyer uh, for four decades before that, I thought I knew what a regulated industry was. And I, some of my client, private sector clients always used to complain about heavy government regulation. Well, when I got into the NSA, I thought, wow, the NSA is the most heavily regulated entity on the face of the earth. It has oversight from the Department of Justice, from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, a separate foreign intelligence surveillance court, um, uh, the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, uh, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, two separate committees of Congress, the entire federal judiciary, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, I think all that's appropriate, not suggesting any, any, any retraction of it. But we do have a very, very robust, and I would submit very effective uh, oversight and set of limits on, on the nature of surveillance. I think we are seeing with cyber maliciousness and, and some other, other problems that the cyber is revealing, some gaps in the way we want to address this. We, we have a a structure where the NSA looks at things overseas, not domestically, properly so, by the way. Um, but but it does. Uh, there are some gaps in authorities. There are some holes due to the legacy system we've set up, and so we may need to tinker with that over the next uh, several years. But we do have a very very robust and effective um, uh, set of oversight mechanisms for for surveillance. And I might add, during my time there and prior to my time there, we did not have a single malicious erroneous use of surveillance, not a single one. And that's that's an important statement, and I don't think many of our allies can say that, let alone our adversaries. Okay, Glenn, well, I could pepper you with many more questions. I have lots, um, but I do think it's time for our virtual audience to get that chance. So okay. Jessica, I think, is going to join us. You've been tracking the questions coming in. I have, yes, we've got a lot of questions. And uh, the first question I was gonna ask is from Bob Moore, who you know, and uh, one of our board members. He says, Glenn, in this technological war, shouldn't the US engage in offensive actions to deter, deter aggression rather than simply rely on defensive solutions? Isn't deterrence the key in cyber, just as it is in military defense? Bob, you've asked a terrific question, as I expected, um, and it's at the heart of a big debate in Washington, um, which is just how much uh, should we use cyber offensively? And there are a lot of problems uh, with it, which, which we can explore here for a minute. But we clearly understand that in the, to take a horrific example, in the, in the nuclear world, it's a very effective deterrent. There's, there hasn't been a single use of, of atomic bombs since, since World War II, of course, for good reason, which is that uh, each country that is a nuclear power has the ability to destroy uh, uh, other countries several times over. And just the sheer threat of that is effective to prevent, hopefully forever, uh, use of nuclear weapons. That isn't the case with cyber. It's a, it's a good analogy, but it isn't a perfect analogy. Why is that? Because it's possible to have cyber maliciousness just below the threshold of war. It can still wreak havoc and can still ruin our lives and yet not be so significant that it warrants a physical reaction. We're certainly not about to go, let's assume, for example, to take my recent, recent example of dark side, and let's assume we could A, figure out that it really was dark side. That's the problem of attribution. It may take a few weeks or months to really prove that. And even if we could prove that it was dark side, we don't necessarily know that it was directly caused by or at the behest of the Kremlin. So we couldn't really do anything directly at the Kremlin. It wouldn't be fair. Uh, to do something unless we had pretty good proof of it. And we may, well, I'm not saying, I don't know what, we have in classified channels. Uh, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't um, raise a stick and metaphorically speaking, beat the Kremlin with it and tell them they're harboring cyber criminals and they need to stop this and impose sanctions. And yes, of course, we should take all sorts of steps like that. But we're not about to send tanks rolling across a NATO line and we're not certainly not about to launch any missiles for that kind of attack. If instead, we had a cyber adversary that really produced a serious negative consequence that caused injury or death or serious physical consequence on our domestic soil, say shutting down the electric grid, causing hospitals to stop in mid-operations, people to die, some horror like that. 
oh, of course, by then we, we, we'd be fully justified and we would take physical action. But a cyber offense is a lot harder. Um, it's a bit of whack-a-mole. Uh, we, we apparently, according to press reports, were effective in doing that after the 2016 elections uh, in 2018 and in 2020 in knocking offline the Internet Research Agency, a, a Kremlin-promoted uh, uh, cyber malef malefactor uh, that was interfering in our election. So it is possible with cyber offense to take a computer down, take a network down, obviously, it can easily be reconstructed in a matter of hours. And it isn't clear that, that the threat of that alone is sufficient deterrence. In order to really have sufficient deterrence, I think we'd have to get into an area um, that would raise the risk of escalation. And that makes us uncomfortable, and rightly so. I, I do think we should have, to be clear, I do think we should have a more robust cyber offense than we now have, to your point, Bob. So I'm all in favor of ratcheting up even more. It takes lots of resources, but at the end of the day, it's not by itself going to be a sufficient deterrent, and that's the problem with it. We, we need a, a whole of society and whole of government approach to this, and that's not something that we in the United States are used to in, in an integrated way, but that's where we need to move to, and that will have an effect. Okay. Uh, this question is sort of a twofer. Are the hackers who are holding companies hostage with ransomware part of the dark web? Why can't professional American hackers be hired by private sector companies and the government to protect our infrastructure? Well, uh, it, it does sound like uh, people like uh, DarkSide, which is the group that is responsible for recent, apparently responsible for recent ransomware attacks, is they have they do have a site on the dark web. In fact, they even advertise a little bit. They advertise their services. They have a help desk and a uh, 800 number, so to speak, uh, for victims to call, and and they're able to engage in ransomware uh, um, ransomware negotiations. They issue press releases. They they just explain that they were a bit sorry that this recent attack uh, had the effect of shutting down the pipeline. That wasn't their goal. So it's a pretty sophisticated adversary. Um, uh, uh, our our cyber offensive capabilities, which reside in the United States Cyber Command, the unit of the military, uh, does have the ability to go after uh, foreign uh, foreign entities like this that that's certainly part of their part of their mission and and they can and presumably should once they identify who it is and where it is and that sometimes takes time and isn't isn't easily done um as far as hiring american hackers to do that well we probably first of all have to probably change a bunch of laws in the united states the computer fraud and the abuse act and others that that prevent improper use of of the internet obviously that is statute is violated every day, but we certainly don't want the government knowingly violated. So we'd have to change some laws. And I'm not sure we really want to put um, the private sector in the position of hacking back, so to speak. I think that raises all sorts of problems that are that are going to be hard to control. And I think most cybersecurity experts feel that that is a job for the government. It, as I said, to go back to my earlier comment, it is supposed to provide for our common defense. It does need to step up its efforts in this area. And I think with this attack, uh, we will see that with a recent series of tax, colonial pipelines, solar winds, et cetera, we'll see the government engage in more robust activity. But again, I go back to my earlier point. Um, it's a chronic it's a chronic condition. We're not going to stop this completely, um, and we just need to manage it better. We can, we can, and we should, but we're not going to get rid of it. Thank you. This next questioner says, Mr. Gerstel, as a junior naval officer, I was sent to an Intel course oriented to our work in Southeast Asia. One major aspect of our work was understanding the two sides of black intel. Today, we have governmental agencies managing news releases, much like black intel. RAND's work has focused on truth decay, and it addresses the presence of this throughout society. Can the U.S. government not be more aggressive in dealing with this? Sure. I don't, uh, Sina, do you, do you have any? I, I'm happy to address it. Do you have thoughts yourself on, on that point? Or if not, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I don't know if I, since you mentioned RAND. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, it's true. Rand uh, has a lot of work in this area, in this space. The the whole idea of truth decay and disinformation, and and how that's evolved over time. And we've looked historically to see um, where there have been periods where where that has happened. And obviously, in the the space that we're in now, it's just a monumental challenge. Um, so I know some of what uh, the idea of um, how to combat that. Of course, you have the pieces online that you mentioned, social media, et cetera, um, where you have the private sector um, basis. But some of it is also education, right? Some of it is having in early education and you know even adults understanding what it is that they're seeing, looking at the sources that they're 
going to um, and and really thinking about that in a critical way. Um, so, you know, it, it's harder once you're sort of surrounding yourself with the same information and what you think is reliable sources. Um, but I do think going to those earlier generations um, and and making part of the curriculum uh, education and understanding consumption of what they see online and where they can go to verify source information, that type of thing, um, is, is a part of it. That's a, that's a longer term game, you know, not the near term, but this isn't going to be an issue that goes away anytime soon. So that's going to be really critical um, uh, as a foundational, I think, skill set. Right. Uh, Sina, I, I couldn't agree more. Let me, let me add uh, uh, just uh, very quickly that um, uh, underscoring your your point that that civic education is going to have a big role in here. I mean, when when um, the recent uh, 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 Pew survey showed that uh, I think some 40 or 45 percent of Americans couldn't even name the three branches of, of government, it's no wonder that there would be a large group of people who would be genuinely disappointed at Vice President Pence's failure to quote correct the Electoral College vote because people just don't understand how our government systems work. I, I'm not picking a political example, I'm just using it to illustrate that we have a, a very, very big gap in civic education and add to that digital literacy. Both of those are being addressed by bills pending in Congress, so that's a really important point of addressing this. The other point I would make um, is that uh, we are not used to in America dealing with disinformation and the response to it the way our adversaries who are creating the disinformation are. Both Russia and China operate in an integrated way. They, their, their government, their private sector, their controlled media, all are engaged in a concerted way to engage in disinformation campaigns that cause an initial piece of information to come out in one way, be amplified and reverberated by controlled accounts on social media, whether it's Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. It's then there's a story on Russia, Russia television or Chinese uh, people's daily media that reports on the number of tweets and how this story is picking up. Then there are stories about how the story is picking up, et cetera, and it just reverberates and gets, gets um, uh, uh, thrown at us in a far more integrated, comprehensive, enveloping way than we do. When, when we are confronted with a, a, mistru a, a misstatement or a falsehood, the United States government through the State Department or the Commerce Department or the White House press secretary issues a press release saying it's wrong, et cetera, and that's the end of it. We do not because we're not comfortable with propaganda. We don't have an integrated way where our private sector and all of government gets together to confront misinformation. So I think we need to move a step in that direction. We don't wanna go into propaganda, sure, I understand that, but we can do a lot more in an integrated way with our federal government to counter this. Thank you. This questioner asks, is it true that insurance companies are leaving the ransomware coverage market? I don't have a good sense of whether they're leaving it or not. They're certainly uh, questioning, I, I, they're certainly questioning the, the current status of, of, of cybersecurity, of, of demands in the cybersecurity area, particularly in the ransomware uh, field, as opposed to just pure damage resulting from pure simple hacks or whatever. Um, and again, I think they all sense what I commented earlier on, which is that this is probably going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and some of these ransomware payouts are very significant in the in deep into the millions of dollars. Um, and you could argue that the very presence of cyber uh, insurance encourages ransomware because the, the ransomware criminals know that there's going to be a deep pocket somewhere that will pay up and the availability of that will cause the company that is the insured to say, well, it's covered by insurance, so let's just pay these guys $5 million and get our computers back. Um, it's a bit of a two-edged sword, obviously. Uh, so the, the mere presence of it may contribute to it. And yet at the same time, we certainly want that loss. Uh, there are many companies that don't want to absorb the loss, and that's, of course, the purpose of insurance. Um, I, I think this area is extremely volatile. It remains to be seen how the industry is going to react to this with an, with an increase in the number of ransomware demands that we will see over the next year or two before we get this, before we overtake this problem. We will overtake it. It's going to take a couple of years before we do, though. A very practical question. What role do apps play? Can you limit your exposure to bad actors by staying away from apps? This could also maybe allude to the TikTok uh, situation that we saw last year as well. Well, I guess if we don't download anything on our phones and don't open up any emails, yes, we'll have a 
really safe experience. We won't be very functional, but I, I don't mean to be flip about it. But um, um, I, look, there, there's a big debate going on right now, especially in Europe, over the nature of app stores and whether they should be limited or not. And people like Apple say that they curate and are very careful about what apps they let into their app store, which are more secure, et cetera. Um, uh, to me, that sounds right. My own personal experiences, that's been true. Um, but uh, but uh, there's no question that there's a trade-off between functionality and availability on one hand, which we certainly want. We don't want to have to type in six passwords and triple factor authentication every time we want to look at a YouTube, right? And that so we could we could make it super secure, but it wouldn't really be useful. And before we send a tweet or forward something, if we had to put in four passwords and get a text to confirm our identity, well, that's not going to really be fun. So this is a huge trade-off issue that we have not sorted out. Um, we need to work. There are solutions in this area that we need to work on. But again, going back to my earlier point, it's it's a, something that with trial and error, we will continue to evolve to a better solution. But it is going to take a lot of work. Thank you. Um, what do you think was the goal of the hackers? And I'm assuming this is in regards to the Colonial Pipeline, since you mentioned that they apologized, that uh, they didn't mean to close down the pipeline. What do you think was the goal? Money or something else? Well, years ago, there was a famous bank robber named Willie Sutman. He was asked by reporters, why do you, why do you rob banks so often, Willie? And his answer was, that's where the money is. And I'm afraid that's the same answer here. Uh, these criminals are very sophisticated. They now do research, as I said, on their victims. They figure out which company has enough cash. They look at their profit and loss statements. They know how much to ask for in ransom. Uh, they know who the general manager is, who the president is, who the chairman of the board is. It's all publicly available. You can find it out. And they send an email saying, we know you made X dollars last year. We know your profits were Y. Um, so it's just, it, it's purely it's purely financial. It's just an easy way to, to make money, and if you're sitting in a in a bulletproof country, so to speak, meaning Russia, you know, Iran, whatever, you can sit there no, and know that you can maliciously attack the United States, impose your rans impose your ransomware on networks in the United States, and get away with it. And that is unfortunately the sad reality right now. Thank you. What does the capital siege mean for the future of security clearances? I'm not sure I know I what think the... that question's probably that question's probably coming to me uh, since I've written a, a good amount about um, about the, <laughs> this particular topic and I even uh, had an article titled almost that uh, commentary. Um, so what the, the big issue that that comes to that is, you know, security clearances for those who um, aren't familiar. It's a, a very detailed process. And as part of that process, you have a long form that you fill out. It's called an SF-86. And in that form, there are various questions that you, you know, answer about your history and, and that type of thing. Um, uh, the government will then do a background investigation, collect information on your criminal history activities, um, and just a slew of um, information about yourself to determine if you're a trustworthy individual, right? If you're, um, if there is just too much risk, uh, and they think that there's going to be a problem, the capital siege brought a couple things to bear. So on in that form, the SF-86, there are questions um, asking about: Have you ever tried to overthrow the U.S. government? Have you um, uh, participated in a terror organization? So some of the challenges right now, there are authority and legal challenges in this space because, well, what is the definition of domestic terrorism? We don't have one, right? There isn't an official definition. So that's one piece. Um, was a capital siege, you know, was someone part of an organized group that you would call it a terrorist group and they were involved in the capital siege and then they apply for a security clearance? Um, or did some of, some of these people had security clearances that were part of the capital siege and are now being prosecuted? Um, so there's a, there's a slew of kind of issues that are being uh, considered right now in the federal government when it comes to security clearance and personnel vetting, um, both you know, ensuring that the system is robust enough um, that uh, if, if someone is prosecuted, you, know, you account for that for the current clearance. Some people have had their clearances suspended. For people coming in to the US government, um, it's ensuring that the vetting system looks at those issues sufficiently. I think a big challenge is, it's one thing if someone's um, you know, uh, going through and has been um, criminally held accountable, right, has been convicted of the crime as part of the capital siege. 
But if that person hasn't, if, if someone participated in the capital siege, um, but hasn't been convicted of a crime, um, then how do you how do you figure that out, account for that, and understand what their role was? The biggest way is you talk to friends and neighbors. Um, that's part of the background vetting process. Um, uh, there's also a piece of looking at someone's information online, right? The government doesn't do that that well. It has the authority and ability to, but as Glenn knows, there's a whole bunch of uh, legal and privacy concerns that the government wants to make sure it's dotting its I's and crossing its T's. So what the capital siege means is it's an example of uh, the type of thing that the government is already looking at, but it just really uh, put a magnifying glass on it, I think, both because there were individuals who were trusted individuals, the US government, um, that had security clearances that participated in the capital siege. Um, and there are likely future individuals who are going to apply for a clearance um, who participated in that. And how, how does the government um, plan to address that and account for that to ensure its ultimate goal of national security and protecting secrets is not um, undermined. Okay, thank you. Uh, this will be our final question. Is there any coordination between the federal government and private sector in discussing funding and deploying technology to mitigate the risk and consequences of a cyber attack? Yes, quite a bit. Um, but like all of these things, it's uh, as because of its novelty, there's a lot of trial and error in this area. Um, but but uh, as we saw with the most recent uh, executive order just issued uh, yesterday afternoon, um, the Biden administration is is moving forward in this area to a greater cooperation with the private sector. The Department of Homeland Security is the principal entity that engages on behalf of the federal government with the private sector, and it has a rich pro rich series of programs uh, uh, under the unit called CISA to engage with the private sector. Um, but I think every private, every cybersecurity researcher would say that we need way more in this area. We need to have a situation in which uh, the private sector has an obligation, at least at some level, maybe for big companies, to immediately report cybersecurity breaches and incidents to some kind of federal center that would merge intelligence together with other information from other private sector companies and produce an actionable result where we could stop cyber attacks as they occur. Maybe we can't stop the initial company, patient zero, so to speak. We can't stop the initial company from being penetrated. As I said, penetrations are inevitable with a sophisticated adversary. But we, instead of having 30,000 companies affected by the next solar winds, maybe it's only 10. And instead of having thousands of or hundreds of hospitals affected by ransomware, maybe it's only two because we nip the attack in the bud. That'll require really robust, effective public-private sharing of cyber information. We don't have that yet. It will require congressional action to do so. But again, that's there are lots of bills that are proposed to it. We probably will, in a few years, be in that position. In the meantime, we're going to be struggling. Glenn and thanks, Sina, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. Um, I know we probably could go on for much longer, but I know we're at the end of the hour. So, Sina, I'll turn this over to you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, well, Glenn, thank you again very much for your time, your valuable insights. We covered a very broad uh, kind of spectrum of issues and I know we could have uh, hashed out many, many more, but thank you very much for joining uh, today. Thank you to the virtual audience for those great questions and we got through quite a few, so that was, um, that was excellent. And then finally, thank you to Kim and the uh, Los Angeles World Affairs Council for hosting this fascinating session today and, and inviting uh, me to participate in it. And I'm honored and, and got a lot out of it as well. So uh, with that, Kim, I'll hand back over to you for any closing remarks. This was terrific. Glenn, thank you so much for thank your expertise. You. And Sina, I, I was such a great opportunity to have you moderate. We need to have you both back here. This is a an ongoing discussion and we all learned so much. So thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you.